Today, we're speaking with a health and fitness coach, as well as raw and revive athlete who started competing when she turned 18 in 2016. She has done six regional shows and five national shows since then, placing fifth in her first two shows before taking an improvement season and winning her next two shows. Then she went on to prep for 20 weeks after an improvement season, but had to shut it down due to COVID. Been there. I understand the pain. She started to go for the national stage in 2021, where she placed 11th before jumping up to second place and then another 11th place. After this season, she hired a new coach and ended up placing fourth at junior nationals and then won her pro card the following month at USA's. Welcome to the show, Megan Long. How are you doing? Uh, It's an honor, an honor. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to dive into so many topics today. Fantastic. How are you? I am so happy you're here yes. and I'm doing well also. I had so much fun prepping this and I know I briefed you before we hit record, but to everyone listening, we got some great listener questions and Megan's really open and that's something she is known for. And she said she'd be really open on this podcast. So um, I'll probably kick it off with a a very interesting question. But before <laughs> I get to that, Um, I got to ask you if there's anything you do or think about right before your heel hits the stage. Uh, I feel like you kind of have like a thousand things that run through your head, but the biggest thing that runs through my head is, am I proud of myself? Am Mm. I proud of what I'm doing right now before my heel hits that stage? Is there anything else I could have done to be better today? That's the last thing I ask myself. And a hundred percent of the time it's no. And then I hit the stage. Okay. For a second, I thought you meant, no, you're not proud of yourself. Oh, you no. Know, if there's, there's anything else could I could have done. done. <laughs> yeah, no. Is there anything else I could have done to be better than I am right now? No. Then let's go have some fun. I love that. I think that's yeah. such a great mentality. That's one of my biggest fears is getting on stage, knowing I could have done more. And I've been on stage when I shouldn't have been on stage, but I still did everything I had to do. And 100%. so I was still And I proud. think that's a really good perspective too. I did everything that I was supposed to do. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that you should be there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I've been, I, I have also been on the end of like, man, my shit is not going well right now, but I did everything that I could have done. And that still makes me proud. And even though if you are in that position, um, to the listeners, if you are in that position and you know that there's more um, that your physique could be bringing, as long as you know that you did everything that you could do, go have fun. I mean, go get the experience, go get the stage time, go get the feedback. Like there's no point in going on stage and just being a stress case. Like it's your time to shine, whether you're at at 100% or not. Totally. And honestly, you'll hit a target and the day you get there, you're already ready to be better. So it's better to just enjoy that moment because as soon as you get off, you already have a new goal anyways. Oh my gosh. Yes. As soon as I get off stage, every time I'm like, what's next? What's next? And I also think that that's not a good thing too, because we sometimes get so caught up in what's next, what's next. We forgot to, we forget to sit in that moment and think how we feel in that time. Cause we're already planning what's next, especially if you didn't perform how you wanted to perform, um, like sit with yourself for that day and kind of think like, what could I have done better? How am I feeling right now? What did I enjoy or not enjoy about this process, this time, instead of getting off stage? And I am notorious for this, getting off stage and saying, okay, what's next? Instead of like, what just happened? Yes. And I think that helps process the emotions too, making the journey more fulfilling. Like, yeah. I remember one of my shows, I was so upset by how I placed And I was like, I'm going to let myself feel it. And I cried by the hotel pool. (laughs) (laughs) Some people are like, don't do that. But I'm like, I feel like crying. I put in so much work. I'm upset Mm -hmm. and I want to be better. And I think by letting myself have that experience and feel it, I remember within like five minutes of pulling myself together after that, I felt like this wave of gratitude. But I think had I pushed that sadness aside, I wouldn't have fully felt the gratefulness as well. I think it's okay. And and it's important to feel those. You are sad. 
you are sad. Yeah. You just prepped for X amount of weeks and you didn't perform how you wanted to, or you didn't place how you wanted to, whatever the case may be. It's okay that you're sad. I think a lot of people get off stage and I'm someone that does this too. I'm like, I got to hold it together. Like good sport, good sport. Just because I'm crying doesn't mean I'm not being a good sport. It means that I'm just upset that I wanted to do better. Yeah, I love that. I think I always say, and I, and this is something I tell myself, I tell my athletes, I tell um, any listeners, winning isn't everything and wanting to win is it Mm. like wanting to win is so much more than having to win because you're not going to win everything. You can't win everything. (laughs) What a beautiful message. Seriously, like wanting to win empowers you to take the action steps necessary to become a better athlete and have a fulfilling journey and be proud at the end of it. But needing to win is like detaching from actually the process and putting all your eggs into this one outcome that is subjective and can change week to week as you actually experienced in earning your pro card you went from 11th or 11th to second to 11th which before I get into the other thing I might as well ask you about that like what was that like for you to have those placings vary before you actually obtained your pro card Oh, that actually gives me thinking about it gives me full body chills because it was heartbreaking. It was it was one of the most heartbreaking moments of my career. I went into junior nationals and I placed second, which was the best that I had ever done at a national show. Um, So climbing the ranks from getting second call out to being, you know, splitting center or whatever the case was and getting second place, my feedback going into um, what was the following show? Oh my gosh, I can't remember junior Nats Um, universe universe. It's hard to remember because it was at the same venue and it's typically in New Jersey, but because of the whole COVID thing, it was all discombobulated. So going from second to 11th, my feedback from Sandy, I sent in my photos um, and and got the judges feedback. And she said, don't change a thing. See you at universe. Hmm. And I am like, holy fuck. I am about to turn pro. Like we are about to turn pro. There's nobody else, you know, um, at the time I knew that Carrion was my benchmark. She was my competition. She was the one um, that had been climbing the ranks as well. She had been doing it a little bit longer than me. So I knew I'm like, okay, you know, I just, I just beat this physique. Um, I know I'm going to be at my best and I was not at my best. And when I went from second place to 11th in a matter of 10 days, I thought I was done competing. I thought that I was going to hang up my heels and like, this isn't for me. Like, I'm just don't, I don't have what it takes to make it to this. Um, So shortly after that was when I decided I need to just take an off season and I need to let myself feel how this feels. I'm not going to keep going and keep going and keep going because I had already been in prep since November. And by this time we're in end of June. So I had been in prep for so long um, that I just felt defeated. Yeah. Yeah. Because you had been pushing yourself for a long time and then you had the show cancellations and then you're finally on stage and you're able to work for this you get great feedback only to come in and not bring what they were looking for so what happened in those 10 days the coach that I with was with at the time there was a lot of emotion and there was a lot of emotional um, decisions and things on my end that I thought I had control over, but I didn't. And I allowed my, the stress and the pressure of, wow, I just missed my pro card by one point. Um, Looking at the scorecards, I felt so much pressure going into this show. Like I have to turn pro. There's no other option. And that pressure, I, I couldn't hold my feet, my physique together. I couldn't. Um, And I'm not sure exactly what happened in terms of like protocols. There wasn't a protocol issue. Um, It was more of a stress response. And I'm someone who's very, very sensitive to stress. So as soon as I started stressing and feeling all of this pressure and all of the noise coming from the outside in, it crushed me. Yeah, it crushed me in that time because I wasn't the person that I am now. Now I can I can handle that pressure and I, I fucking love that pressure. But at the time I couldn't, I couldn't perform. And I knew that I wasn't at my best. And I almost, when I was backstage pumping up, I remember looking in the mirror and hitting my front pose. And I'm like, I am not turning pro today. Hmm. Like it was just, it, it almost made me want to just not go on stage because I'm like, I'm not at my best right now. I'm not going to perform my best. I know that I don't feel my best. Why am I going to go on stage right now? 
So I did it and it happened. <laughs> and it was a huge yeah. learning experience for me because that was when I realized that this sport is so subjective. You can be the best in the show one day and the worst in the show the next day. And it doesn't matter. It matters who shows up. You only have to beat who shows up. And that that's that's really the reality of, of the sport is beating who shows up. Hmm. There was something in there that I wanted to pick at a little bit, which okay. is now you're a person who can handle the pressure. And I'm wondering if it was turning pro that you felt like obtaining that title that helped you to see now I can handle it, or if you had to become someone who could handle the pressure and that ultimately led to you earning your pro card. It it was more me realizing I have to learn how to handle the pressure um, and learn how to perform under the pressure because I realized with the person that I wanted to be, the pressure wasn't going anywhere. The pressure wasn't going to change. And I put it on myself. And I, I like that because I do think that I perform better under it. Um, but the outside pressure was what I wasn't able to handle in that time. I think that I just had more um my intentions with competing weren't as pure. My intentions were, I have to win. And that's where I've developed the mindset now of, I want to win. So putting, I have to win, I have to win, I have to win, put that that, that external pressure on me and took the fun out of it. It really did. Um, and it made it less enjoyable for me because I was feeling if I didn't win, I wasn't having fun. Hmm. And were you an athlete growing up? My whole life, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, that's where I got that that derived feeling of I have to I have to win. And my brother has been in competitive sports my whole life also, and we compete with everything too. So having that competitive edge of always wanting to be the best, um, I think that it it kind of got the best of me in that time. Yeah, that's we all want to be. We all want to be the best, um, and that's that goes without saying. Absolutely, yeah, I love that. Everyone in this sport wants to be the best to some regard. There's some who just do it for fun, but those of us who are really competing to compete, like it is to compete, meaning we want to win, meaning we want to mm -hmm. be the best, and when we also take the perspective of it's important to be the best for myself, I think it makes the journey so much better. And you had a shift happen where it was no longer about needing to just win to know that it was fun. So what was it that made you want to achieve this status or milestone originally versus what you now maybe want to represent within the IFBB? That's a really good question. I love that. Um, I kept losing. <laughs> It really, really just, I had to do something different. And when it's not a physique issue, you realize it's a mentality issue. And I realized where my mind goes, my body's going to follow. And that was when I took the off season. Granted, it wasn't an extreme time amount uh, off. I took about seven or eight months, but I knew I didn't need that much time in order to improve where I needed to improve to turn pro. I knew that I needed to change my mindset and my approach with things or my body was never going to get on board. Um, so the first thing that I, I knew that I had to do was a re remove all of the emotions from the coach that I had at the time and hire someone who was going to be more unbiased with my physique and just give me straight up how, how I needed to be, what I needed to do, because I have enough experience in this to know, I know I don't. I hate saying when people are like, oh my God, I, like, I know my body, but yes, I know where I need to be and I know what I need to look like or um, the places I need to be at a certain time in order to get to that goal. Um, so I kind of was just like, I, I have to do this. It was definitely one of the hardest decisions I've had to do, um, but I knew that it was going to be what was best for my career and taking the emotion out of like, hey, I know you're a good person and I, and I don't, this isn't a knock on you. This is for me. This is a career choice. And I know that I need to, to move forward with this. Can you expand on some of the emotions that were present with that coach? So yes, absolutely. I was in a relationship my, with my coach prior to that. I We dated for about a year and a half, two years, and we worked really, really well together when things were good. 
been, you know, obviously going through a breakup in itself is a, it's a massive life change. And it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a breakup where it was like, oh, we're not together. It was like, we lived together. There was a lot of integration into our lives. And that was in the middle of my season. So, um, the, the very first show that I did that year was in April. And that was the like very first when like the breakup started happening. Um, so I kind of just pretended like I had it together the whole entire season. And that was kind of circling back to that last show where I got 11th after getting second was when my body was like, you're not processing any of this. You're pre- cause I'm the type of person like after prep, after prep, after prep. And then for fast forward four months. And I'm like, I'm fucking heartbroken. Like I need to feel what I'm feeling right now. I can't do anything until I fix my heart. And so that was kind of when I decided like, I need to go my separate ways because you can't heal in the same environment that you were broken. And that had to be separated. But unfortunately it was, it was a very hard decision because it was like, Hey, you got me to this point, And I want to acknowledge that I wouldn't be where I am without your guidance and without your help. But I have to go my separate way right now in order to get to the next point, because there's too much emotion on my end. It's not a you thing. It's a me thing. So taking ownership for that and realizing that I can't do this. I think that was paramount to me going all in on myself the next season because I realized that I wasn't also doing this for somebody else because I had this extreme desire to just make him proud just make him so proud like if I win then it'll be this like if I just turn pro then it'll make him so proud and if I do this and that's where again circling back I started competing for the wrong reasons I started competing to beat people that I wasn't even competing against and beat someone that wasn't even in the same class as me and um just to make someone proud instead of trying to make myself proud. And that came full circle when I hired Matt Jansen, um, the very beginning of 2022. And I was like, Hey, this is what it is. This is where I'm at. I just need your help finishing the job. That was a lot to unpack. unpack. You guys, if you're listening to this, I'm also on video with Megan and it's on YouTube if you wanted to watch, but like you can see the facial expressions that way. But yeah, I'm just sitting here like taking that in because there's a few directions I'm imagining listeners are probably going. And that's a um, story that I've never really shared publicly, like full the full story of what happened during that season, because I was also so protective over it. And I was like, I don't want anyone to look bad. I don't want to like have anything said bad about anybody on any parties. Um, And so I was trying to protect everything at all costs. And in that process, I was the one getting hurt. And Mm -hmm. I put my competition career um, on the back burner to try and protect things that I had no business protecting. That is serious truth bombs right there. Like how often do women in general just do that protect everybody else and at the risk of themselves too fucking much let me tell you I still find myself to this day doing things like that along those lines of like am I doing no this I need to do this for me I need to be selfish I need to be selfish so that was last season I kind of went through a huge shift And, you know, losing that relationship and completely separating, again, there was a lot of integration. So pulling back myself from everything, every person involved in anything, and I went complete solo. Like I had, I mean, very minimal friends. I had very minimal support throughout the majority of my prep, and it was beautiful to me because I proved to myself that I'm doing this for me for the first time I felt that in so long. I'm like, I did this. No one here is clapping for me. Not a single fucking person is clapping for me right now. And that was one thing that was beautiful about working with Matt too, is he's a very just, he doesn't have a ton of emotions, which is great. He doesn't tell you, you know, you look good in your updates or we're on the right track or hell yeah, good work or good job. There's none of that. So it's just head down, grind, 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 grind. And when you finally get that, we look good here. You're like, I remember getting my first good job from that. I was like 12 weeks or 13 weeks in 
And, you know, after not getting that for so long, you're kind of like, damn, am I performing? Mm-hmm. And when you finally get good work, it's like, yes. And then you're able to keep pushing forward. I think it's really cool how you found the approach that worked best for you. And in that process, you realized as well that you had been sweeping under the rug, the heartbreak that you had experienced and realizing how the intertwining of your lives wasn't benefiting your growth moving forward. And you said something really beautifully. You said you can't heal in the same environment you were hurt. I believe that's how you put it. And it was really well said. And I wanted to drive that point home because that speaks to the journey you then took yourself down, which was going solo. And it almost sounds like you started to develop a more secure attachment with yourself and learn to support yourself and validate yourself versus needing it from elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. During that time, that was when I kind of had to break myself down to build myself back up. And it's led me to, we come full circle. It's been, you know, over the 365 days now. And I get a lot of questions on how do you get to the self-love part? Like, how do you love yourself so much? Like you're so in love with yourself. And I really want to drive home the point that it hasn't always been that way. I haven't always, I mean, during that phase of that prep and during that breakup, There was times where, you know, you feel you're not good enough. Why am I not good enough? When am I going to be good enough? And I remember going through phases where I didn't even want to like look in the mirror because I just didn't feel good enough. And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to get to the place that I wanted to get on my own. And that was when I kind of dove more into like um, hiring like a life coach, more like a mentor. I don't want to say a therapist, but it was along the lines of that. Um, Shout out to Grant and Celeste because they're fucking amazing humans and I would not be the person that I am without them today. Um, They kind of just... They showed you, they show you who you are and who you want to be and how you can get there. We all have, um, imagine it like this. We all are a light and we have layers and traumas. The layers are traumas and they're hurt and they're, they're pain. And what they did for me was they started peeling back those layers. They started peeling them back one at a time and one at a time, you know, the very first call they asked me, so who are you? And I started, is like, well, I'm a coach. I'm a bikini coach. No, those are things that you do. That's not who you are. And I looked them dead in the face and I had, I said, I have no fucking idea. And being there and being in that position, you have no option, but to start figuring out who, who you are, because they just showed you that you have no idea who you are. And I think that it's beautiful to be there. And I think to all of the listeners and anybody's kind of struggling going through that of who am I or the identity crisis, I it's okay to be there and it's, and it's beautiful to be there because you have nowhere to go, but find yourself, go find yourself. And when you find yourself, you realize you are all that you will ever need. And that to me, I always get asked like, when are you going to start dating? Are you dating? And I'm like, honestly, like I've dated my whole life and I finally love who I am and what I bring to every single room that I walk into. No, no, I'm good right now. You know? Yeah. Like it, it just, just that journey to self-discovery is one that I, I want everyone to be able to find. What was contributing to you not feeling like you were enough during that prep? Was it the need to satisfy or make someone proud or was it coming from something else? I think it was a lot of self-infliction for sure. Um, I put that on myself, you know, when I think anyone goes through a breakup or um, there's any sort of I want to say like infidelity (laughs) going on that you feel like, well, what was it that I wasn't, you know, good enough? Why not me? And then also when you start, when you tie in the integration of the coach client relationship and you're like, well, maybe if I just win, like this person will love me. Or maybe if I just show that I'm a good athlete and I'm a good coach and I can run a business and I could do all of these things that this person will like me or love me or respect me. And then at the end of the day, it still wasn't enough that I felt like it was a me problem. Like, why can't I just be loved? Or why am I not capable of being loved? And when I when I started working with Brant and Celeste and I realized that um, what people do to you is an infliction of how they feel about themselves, not what you do. That was when I really started to be able to lean into that part of this isn't a me problem. 
I did nothing wrong. I couldn't have been better. I couldn't have done more. I couldn't have performed or done anything better. This is on you. Oh shit, this is on you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really empowering. I love that. I think that's such a great takeaway also, like to be able to look at yourself and know that you're starting to question yourself. And after something like infidelity, for sure, like I can absolutely relate to that, unfortunately. And I think a lot of women listening can, even men listening can relate to that. And it leads you to question sometimes yourself, sometimes love, sometimes the whatever you're trying to date. And it makes you wonder like what like, is any of this realistic for me to expect? Is it fair for me to expect to be treated well if so often you're not? And then you were being fed some validation from this person or when you are being given like kudos, it feels really good and your mind like latches onto that. And I know because I followed your journey for a while that there was kudos, but when it's coming from that place from like a coaching relationship and then you're like hungry for it and it can definitely shift your focus and make you feel less than connected to yourself so you said you went on a journey to finding yourself and I want to touch on that real quick yeah they call that and I've learned this it's called breadcrumbing when you get a little bit a little bit here and you think that the lows are so low that the highs are that aren't even high are considered high because you get a little good job or like, yay, or like, you're doing good. You're like, oh my God, I got a little bit. How can I get more? How can I get more? How can I get more? And yeah, the, the paradox of it, of being breadcrumbing. When I learned that, I was like, that is what I just lived for an entire, an entire season. So I wanted to touch on that for anybody listening who feels that they're in that situation where they're kind of just just attaching to that little bit, like you're worthy of the whole goddamn loaf, you know, yes. like look at the little pieces and the little pieces. And then you realize like, wow, my bar is so mother effing low that I need to raise this thing like way high. And I need to start baking my own bread. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, that was like so hard for me to come to terms with because I was like, dang, I would tell my friends some of what was happening in the past for me and they're like why are you so excited about something that's so normal like that should be happening <laughs> and I'm like really I'm like, like you will not believe it I said it was thirsty and like I got a water bottle exactly like, shit and they're like what <laughs> I know there'd be things that my friends would tell me about like just dates that they went on and I was like Hmm, that's really extremely nice and amazing. And they're like, that's supposed to be that that's one. That's normal. I'm like, does he have a brother? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that is that's huge. And I think a lot of women experience that because it happens over time. And I really want to drive that home because when you get to point Z, it didn't start there it slowly starts to get there. And all of a sudden you're at this point and you're like, holy fuck, how did I get here? How yeah. is the smallest things? How am I praising these or making these things, things that I should be happy about when that's just day-to-day life, you know? Yeah. That's like, and that's, and that's huge for a lot of women. I think that you experience that and you, we normalize it because again, it happens over time that you don't even realize till maybe you're chatting with somebody or you're around another relationship or a couple or whatever it may be. You're like, wow, I'm actually being treated like shit. (laughs) Yeah. And to that point, honestly, like I think so much of it has to do too with a lot of us who are afraid to end up being alone or being left, or if we've had a history of infidelity, or it's something that we've witnessed or we've seen we're like well I'll just take what I can get because I'll never be loved again like this so I'd rather stay than leave and risk being hurt again or risk never having any of this love you start to doubt that what you want is even capable of being given to you so at least that's a big reason why I stayed for so long is because I was like well I'll never find someone who loves me in these ways I'll just sacrifice it but it's like you can't with all those other yeah and then, and then I think it becomes more of like a trauma bond. Then yeah. you're like, well, you can't leave me because this, this, and this. 
And no, yeah, no. If you guys are listening right now and you're in this situation, get the fuck out. <laughs> because Do it sooner yourself, than I did. <laughs> loving yourself and getting to the point where someone needs to be such an addition to my life right now. You have to, and I'm not saying like I'm putting myself on this pedestal or anything, but you have to really bring a lot to me right now for me to want to dedicate or carve out time for you day in and day out because- I really like what I got going on and like, and this might be a little sus, but I'm like, if you have the opportunity to fuck this up, I'm good. (laughs) (laughs) You might hurt me. I'm okay over here. Thank you though. Bye. (laughs) Well, you've set new standards for yourself. You raised the bar and you're not saying I'm not open. You're just saying it's got to meet these standards. And we learn that through those difficult times. And when you switched coaches, you switched to someone who was not specialized in bikini. And one of our listeners wanted to ask like, what influenced that decision? And did you ever doubt yourself knowing you were switching to someone who wasn't like known for bikini? Yes and no. I never doubted myself um, because I have been competing for so long and I've done, you know, a copious amounts of research and whatever it may be. My biggest thing was I loved Matt for the way that he talked to his athletes and he, he says things like, thank you for letting me help you. Like those types of things, we were, we were a team. Um, I wanted to give him, not say give him the opportunity, but have him give me the opportunity. I was on Raw and Revive already. I'd been around Matt a ton. I've met him. Um, Justin actually did work directly with him. So I, I had a relationship with him already. And my biggest thing was I knew he could get me peeled and I could handle the rest. Hmm. I just need you to bring me in the best conditioning that you can bring me in and I will handle the rest. Make sure my health is at the forefront and if it needs to slip a little bit, whatever we got to do to turn pro, we're getting the job done. Um, I don't think that we need to be hyper-focused on people that are like, oh, they're known for bikini. Um, What are they bringing their athletes like in terms of conditioning Um, and how are they getting them there in the manner of like their health or what are they putting at risk for that, I think is very important because I had, you know, I I did work with opposing coaches outside of that. So I'm like, what do I need? In addition, I have the experience. I have the knowledge. Again, I just need you to get me in shape. And I couldn't do that myself because I will drive myself into the ground. <laughs> I knew I was, I was, ta- I was going, taking the route of like, I, I can do this myself. I'm knocking on the door of turning pro. I knew it wasn't um, if I knew it was when. Um, so I was like, I can't do this myself because I know that I will be on 1700 hours of cardio. <laughs> right. Yeah. You wanted a pair of eyes on you who was going to push you and get you peeled, get you where, you know, you would take yourself to, but mm-hmm. do it in a way that maybe was more conducive to your long-term vision than, okay. Now you said I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Like, I don't want to put my health at risk too much, but if it's sacrificed a little bit, that's okay. I think that's the MO for most competitors. We recognize right. there comes a point where you can just look at us and you're like, Ugh. you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. Yeah. You have to go there. You, you have to go there. And that's one thing that you need to understand, you know, as an, as a new competitor or even trying to climb the ranks at the national stage is I think that a lot of people put like, well, I want to, I want to, I want to be healthy. I understand that, but we'll fix your health later. If we have to get to point, like uh, we have to get to a point where your health has to go right now need to get you in shape you know what I mean yeah and if you're not comfortable with it then you can put the brakes on it and decide that there's another time but you're really delaying the inevitable which is that eventually it will come to a point where it's putting your health at risk but if you're starting from an unhealthy place you're just going to be yep yeah yeah you have to be in a good position when you're starting like if you're already starting and your food's low and your cardio is already high I mean you're looking down the barrel of a loaded gun like no go into an improvement phase you know get your food into a good place get your hormones optimized um so I, I started from a good place and I knew that I was in a good place so I that was one thing me and Matt hopped on a call and I was like I I'm also coming from the background of sports and loving bodybuilding so much I mean I love the days where I feel like I'm immobile because I have no energy I love the days when I wake up and I'm like how the fuck am I gonna get through today and then at the end of the day I'm like wow I made it another day 
another day. It instills something in you that makes you feel like there's nothing in this planet that you can't do because I just did the one thing that I need to survive and that's eat. I just stopped basically. I mean, really, I didn't really have any food to eat. Um, yeah. and, and you just, you, you survived that and you're like, I can kind of immortal. <laughs> yeah. It's really euphoric sometimes, like the way we push ourselves and it influences other areas of our life so often where it's like, if I can do that, I can face this or I can manage that. Yes. Have you noticed it impact other areas? Oh yeah, for sure. There's times, you know, there's times in a lot of things where I giving up, like kind of crosses my mind and I'm like, no, like I, I know what I'm capable of. I know what my subconscious is trained to do. I know where I can go to get to what I want to be, you know, even outside of bodybuilding in terms of business um, and doing things like that. Like it's not easy doing all of it. And as you know, like, being an entrepreneur and taking on all of this, it's a lot, but I love it. And I really wouldn't have it any other way. And there's times where I'm doing something that's hard and I'm like, man, if I could turn pro, like if I could go two days without water, if I could do this, like I can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. So how did you launching your business maybe influence your perspective on the sport? Cause you became a, a coach and maybe just walk us through like what even inspired that. What inspired me to become a coach. Mm -hmm. So by the time I had, launched my coaching business. I had been in the fitness space, I would say about four years. Um, I had done a couple shows. I'd worked with three coaches at the, I think three or four coaches by then, because when I started competing, it wasn't cool. Instagram wasn't really like popping off with fitness like it is now. Um, I started competing because a girl in my gym back home was in WBFF. And I was like, I, whatever she's doing, she looks cool. She trains hard. She's a badass. I want to do that. So my initial goal was to do a WBFF show. So that's what kind of got me into bodybuilding. And then I just wrote that out. I did shows. I hired coaches. You know, you go through at first, I went through a couple coaches. because I was like, that was really bad. That was really bad. But you also don't know what's good. Your first coach, because it's your first coach. So you're like, is this bad? Is this good? And then when I got another coach, I was like, wow, that was really bad. Then when I got another coach, I'm like, holy shit, those were both really bad. (laughs) And then I got to a point where I had gained enough knowledge. I had done all of the, the certifications online, all of the things that don't really mean anything. I had done all of that and COVID hit. I was bartending at the time. I was working about a shit ton of hours a week, maybe like 70 hours a week bartending just to like get, get by pay for competing and a coach because that was one thing that was a non-negotiable for me. I don't care how much the coach was. I was going to get, I was going to have a coach at all times because coming from a sports background, I needed that. I needed that community. I needed, um, you know, the, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the leadership I needed to be just held accountable and push. I needed that push. Um, so when COVID happened and I lost my job, I was like, it's a doggy dog world. And this is a saturated air quotes for those of you who aren't watching saturated industry, but I know what I have to offer and I know the vision that I want to have and I need to get to fucking work. Yeah. So I launched my coaching business in October of 2021. So we're coming up this year will be three years and it did more than I ever could have imagined. I had no idea the people that had been following along my journey for so long and were so inspired by the things that I did and my approach to things. Um, I, I think I had 50 athletes like six months in. That's awesome. And it was just from there. I was like, I need to know more. I've done, you know, several mentorships with very highly respected coaches. I've done courses of out the ass I've done. I've lived the, I've anecdote data now, you know, I've put several girls on stage and it's just kind of built from there. But one of the main things that competing has brought to this is I want to lead from the front. I want to make sure that my team has someone to look up to at all times and say like, that's my coach. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that kind of, you know, this conversation comes full circle of terms of why I protected what was going on in my life so much is because 
it, and now I realize it wasn't a good thing to, sh it's okay to show weakness. I think that when we are so conditioned to think that if we show that we're weak, we're not strong. And I think that it's weak that you can't show that you're weak. I'm strong enough to show that I'm not doing okay right now. Yeah. Um, so all of this has kind of brought me to be able to be the coach and the leader. And um, I would definitely consider myself more of like a mentor for my athletes as well. I'm someone that, you know, they can come to when things aren't going right. I'm not just a coach that's like, yeah, here are your protocols. Go fuck yourself if you have things going on. I'm like, hey, we're not progressing this week. And I know it's not a protocol issue. What's going on? Let's hop on a call boom, hop on a call, we get on the same page, and all of a sudden the wheels start turning, things start moving, progress starts taking off, and it's all because we had that one call of like a mindset shift. Yeah, absolutely. It makes such a big difference to have a coach who you can actually communicate with and who's going to be there for you. And because you had learned the hard way that pushing things aside doesn't work, it's important to give your athletes, it sounds like it's important to give your athletes that space to actually yes. share what's going on and look at it from a whole a whole picture perspective and when you said you wanted to lead from the front and lead by example it made me think about how you portray your improvement seasons and your preps and you've always been very open about like enjoying both sides of it right all of this part of the process and you've taken a few different in improvement seasons and in this improvement season you've been promoting a lot of like you really love how you're looking you love the shape that you're taking you're pushing heavy weights you're strong you look like you're really enjoying it you always look like you're enjoying it in the gym but like what was it that you feel has allowed you to take that mentality of body image love and enjoying and embracing that side of this this sport to be fully transparent if you don't you're going to get burnt out really quickly and I want to be in this for the long haul I want to compete for the next five to seven years or as long as my body gives me the ability to compete um that I know that the weight game is going to come whether I like it or not um of course we can control you know how much excess body fat we do gain and what is a healthy amount of body fat but I was like if I don't lean into this and fully embrace this phase I can't, I'm not deserving of a prep. I don't want to love myself only at 8% body fat because that's so fucking unrealistic for such a long duration. You get that dopamine spike. And I think a lot of girls get addicted to the chase that you get of like waking up and seeing new lines or new veins or new, 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 that when they transition into more of an off season and they start to see those lines dissipate, there's a huge dopamine drop that they're not getting. And I'm someone that was feeling that same way. And I'm like, why am I not feeling this way anymore? I need to love myself right now. I need to accept that this is, this isn't my off season body. This is my body period. Yeah. And I think putting a lot of connotation of a, a lot of females have uh, are notorious for putting, Oh, off season, off season, off season body. No, that's your fucking body period you know like that is what your body is comfortable at especially at that six to seven month mark post show like that's where your body wants to sit pretty naturally I'm someone who does sit at a higher body fat naturally and it's taken me a long time to accept that I am someone that does that because there are a lot of girls that can sit a lot leaner five to seven pounds you know above stage weight and accepting that I am not one of those people I've always had thick legs. I've always had, you know, bigger legs than everybody else. And I've always had that lower body dominant and stop trying to compare myself to the, the females that do sit a little bit leaner in off season has been huge this off season. And I really have been trying to put that out on social media a lot more because I see a lot of people who post and prep post, 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 post. And then all of a sudden the off season comes and they just disappear because they don't feel like their physique is worthy enough to be posted. And I want to note that most competitors in an off season, you still look fucking crazy compared to, you know, normal people. Like Absolutely. you still look like, wow, but you're comparing yourself to fucking Jen Dory and Laura Lee Chapatos. Like, yeah, of course you don't think you're good enough, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I think just the stopping comparing yourself is, is going to be a huge. 
I really love that advice to not compare yourself and identify like how your body is unique to you and what's normal for your body or a natural response. Like I've found over time that I'm not a five to seven pounds above stage weight girl. I can, I can keep it tight in those weeks, <laughs> show, you know, like I can do what I have to yeah, do. Yeah, Like I'm not plus 30, but I'm definitely up 10. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've been, I've been up 50. I've been up, I've been there. So I'm not going to say I have it, but you know, what's important is what you said. Exactly. Like this is your body period. I love that. And another thing that I'll share as advice too, because I work with a lot of people with their body image in this sport and something that Mm -hmm. I've found happens is exactly what you were saying with like, they wake up and they see the lines. If we're constantly positively celebrating these things over and over again, what do you expect is going to happen when they start going away? You're going to feel like I'm no longer amazing or we're celebrating or because you've Mm -hmm. now celebrated it day after day for months on end, it's going to be strange. It's going to take some adjusting. So being sure to celebrate the process and how you're showing up for yourself and the commitment to this sport and and executing on your plan is going to take you so much further than only celebrating lines on your stomach or veins on your arms yeah celebrate those things that's great but know what's contributing because you can get to that result in a lot of unhealthy unsustainable ways that won't allow you to have longevity in this sport and if you're celebrating that process that's not helpful for the long term but if you're proud of your process and you celebrate it then you have a different perspective coming out because you can still trust which brings me to a question for you you can trust that your body is going to take the shape it needs to take the next season when you go into your improvement season. But what do you do to really like know or recognize that? Because a lot of people struggle with, I can no longer see the changes happening. Like I do on prep with a day-to-day basis. How do you accept or maybe reinforce even to clients? Like, no, the results are coming, even though you can't see your body getting smaller or taking that shape necessarily. Um, in an, an improvement season, it's a little bit difficult because the the progress is, is a lot longer. You know, it's not, oh, this week, wow, your glutes grew an inch. And this week, it's so much slower over time. Um, I, I like to instill just, just patience. Like, what is the end goal? And I like to kind of like show my clients like without, you know, kind of, I almost like to say like put them back them into their own corner of like, what's your end goal? Well, there's not really one. Okay then this is a journey. There isn't an end goal of when I get here, I'm done. You're done what? You're done improving. You're done training. Like there's not really something that you're like, I'm done doing this. Um, And that's one thing I like when the transition into prep into off season is a lot of people get kind of stuck in there. Like now what? I'm like, okay, now you still wake up. You still do your cardio. You still hit your meals. Um, And the weight gain is going to come at whatever pace it needs to come with the protocol Um, and know that with that weight gain, you are improving as long as your training is where I need it to be. um, And we're attacking your weaknesses over time. You're going to see those changes. It's such an exciting part of this process too, because when you get on stage again, that won't lie about how you treated your improvement season. Yep. We always say in bodybuilding, you know, what you do in the dark comes to light on stage Mm. for sure. And that that's something that sticks with me a ton because it can be, you know, it can be really isolating to be in this sport, especially if you don't have, you know, to listeners that don't have a ton of support or a lot of understanding around them, like what you're doing and why you're doing this. You don't need people to validate why you're doing this. You don't need people to clap for you. Um, so learning how to clap for yourself and be proud of you're not where you were yesterday, but you're not where you want to be tomorrow. That's okay. That's great. Yes, that is bodybuilding. I feel it's like body. Yes, one hundred percent. That is bodybuilding. You're never gonna be satisfied, but that's 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 how we continue to grow. If we were satisfied, every there wouldn't be entrepreneurs. There wouldn't be millionaires. There wouldn't be things like that because we would all just be average. And that's the reality of it. <laughs> exactly. And humans are literally built to strive. Like we are more satisfied by striving than we are by achieving. Yeah. So that tells us that we need to commit to things in our life, whether it's bodybuilding or not, commit to things in your life that make you want to keep striving for more. Cause that's going to feed you a, 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 on a soul level as a human being. Yeah. Very gratifying. We, we do so much better 
with structure, whether you're a lifestyle client, uh, whatever you're doing, if you have structure to follow, I promise you, your life is going to start getting better. I've noticed, you know, when I, when I get a new athlete or anybody who's just like reaching out for advice and I'm like, you can't get your shit together because you have no structure. Your life is just like, I mean, you eat by one o'clock and you're just off the handlebars and you train sometimes or you work out sometimes and your body, we as humans psychologically thrive off of that structure when I'm, and that's why I think a lot of people in prep notice a lot of progress in their other, other areas of their life. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm in prep and this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. I'm like, cause you're so regimented and you're so structured within your mind that everything else around you is, is also structured. And it's kind of like a domino effect. And then when you transition into off season and you just say, fuck this, I'm gonna go eat this and do this and all this stuff. You're like, why am I struggling mentally? Yeah. You drop the ball on all of that structure that you just loved so much that you kind of need to reel it back in, not from like, you know, a weight gain or a body fat perspective, but for a mentality perspective, your body needs that. Your mind needs that absolutely agree because it's so often like people be like I miss being in prep it's like do you miss being on prep or do you miss the structure you're not bringing your life do you miss being on prep or do you miss seeing the results of consistent daily effort because those things are very different and you can create that even in your improvement season it's one of those things that connects the two seasons and can actually make it a less difficult transition So I love that you said that. And you also brought up a point that some people won't understand this journey. And if you don't have supportive people in your life, you don't have to explain it. But you have a special relationship with your brother and he's in the industry as well. And he's been very supportive and you of him. So can you tell us more about that relationship with him and how that maybe bond has actually strengthened each of your journeys in this sport? Yeah, it's it it's funny because Brayden has been someone my entire life who was like the star child. It was, I mean, he was the record breaking football playing freak. And when I started transitioning into bodybuilding when we got out of high school, I didn't have the support. Everyone in my family, uh, I don't have a ton of family, just more so like immediate family. They thought that I was insane. This was the stupidest thing that I could have ever done. Like, I'm not sure why you're paying this or doing this or whatever. Um, So when I moved out to Texas, Brandon, we've always kind of like worked out. We always kind of like, you know, and he was someone who was super into working out. I mean, he'll be at the gym four or five hours a day. Like he loves working out. And then transitioning outside of football, he just was at the gym all the time because that's what made him feel like he was kind of like on the field. Um, And so when I started getting good, I was like good at bodybuilding by like year four, um, I kind of like nudged at him to like, hey, why don't you try, you know, transitioning into like doing a bodybuilding show, seeing how you like being, having a coach again, having that structure. And it was like, no, 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 no. And then when he finally did it, It was, we bonded so hard over now you finally understand because he had, he did go, he's never missed one of my shows. He's been at every single one of my shows ever since I've competed, but there was that lack of connection of like, why are you doing this? He would see me on the hard days and just be like, dude, just quit. Like, what the fudge are you doing? And I'm just like, you don't understand. You don't understand. So then when he got a coach and he did his first show and he got off stage and he was like, holy shit, I get it. I get it. And that kind of like grew our connection. I mean, I would say that was the main thing that really started driving us to be as integrated as we are was because we found a love for it. We found a love for the sport and a passion for just wanting to be better. That when I got him, I say to the dark side and he started doing shows, he started getting into like wanting to help people. And I, wanted him to do it on his own before I was like, Hey, why don't you join a team as an assistant coach? Because a team is like my baby. Like I built this and I care about it so much, like more than I care about anything that I didn't want to just bring him on. Cause he was my brother. And like, I thought that he was going to perform. So he did his own coaching thing for a little bit for probably about a year. Um, and that was when we kind of decided that we work better together. Our Mm -hmm. energy, our connection, um, everything, our chemistry is just better together. 
we joined forces and 18 kind of just took off from there. How'd you come up with 18? So I wanted to, I don't want to like toot my own horn or anything, but I feel like I was one of the first coaches that started really driving, calling your clients athletes. And when I was getting into it, it was client, 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 client. And I just hated that it was like a client because it more, it, it, it registered to me as more of like a transaction. Like, yeah. oh, this is my client. And I felt like there was a lot of ownership around that. So I wanted something that had athletes in it. I really wanted to like, athletes was like the focal point of what I wanted. And one day I remember I was actually in Orlando. Um, I can't remember what I was in Orlando for. And I was like, we're the A-team, the A-team, A-team athletes. And then it just stuck. And again, nobody liked it. Everyone was like, that's stupid. You can do better. And I was like, hey, fuck you guys. I like it. I'm gonna roll with it. And now like everyone loves it. Yeah, it's awesome. I think it's a great name and it yeah. speaks to what you wanted to attract into your clientele as well. And you now got athletes, you know, and then you're letting people know that's also the expectation is that you'll show up as an athlete and, and I'm the coach and that's what we're going to do. And I think it sets a standard without having to explicitly paint that picture. It just does mm -hmm. it on its own, which is really cool. And I love to hear that this relationship with your brother has also been a great partnership with business and the way that you guys show up for the people who hire you and work with you. And you had some positive relationships. You have a positive relationship with your current coach now too. Um, now, I did want to ask you a question about, well, this was kind of the juicier question that someone asked, and I think it somewhat fits in here. We're just going to throw it in. But All right, lay it on me. <laughs> let's go. Um, Someone wanted to know, and I was curious about this too, but how do you handle some of the mean girl hate and comments and gossip and stuff like that shared online, especially on Reddit? I'm actually glad that you asked this because anyone struggling with anything like this, I really want to try to bring some light to it because when this was going on last year, um, I know where the source, I know what it was derived from and it, for a little bit, it was just like, oh, mean girl words here, mean girl words here. Um, and I can handle that. But like, then it was downright bullying. Like straight up, I was getting fucking bullied. Can we and pause for a second? I didn't see it, but could you, and I'm sure there's people listening who didn't. What kinds of things were being said or shared? Um, People were directly attacking my character. Um, things that, you know, the type of coach that I was, there was someone specifically online who was saying that they were, they were coached by me. And I know for a fact that they weren't coached by me, whether they were, um, anonymous or not. I know that I didn't, those things that they were saying never happened. Um, and it was just a phase of, I feel like there was a lot of negativity around my name, um, because of the relationship that ended with my previous coach. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't exactly um, on good terms. So there was a lot of negativity around it. Um, and it kind of was just like a shitball storm that just kept rolling and just kept rolling. And then it was a lot of eyes on me because I was getting close to my show of people, you know, like she doesn't look like a bikini competitor. She's not fit for the division. Like she's this, she's that. Um, and then it started getting to a point where, um, there was an entire, I mean, sub thread about me. There was a whole sub thread that people would go on every fucking day. And it would be seconds after I posted a story, it would be online. And they would just be like, it would be something so simple as like, right after I turned pro, for example, I got the IFBB pro patch and put it on my bag because I'm a fucking pro now. And I was doing a dumbbell row or something. And Someone screenshotted it seconds after I posted and said, of course, she's still riding her high horse, put the pro patch in there. Something like, like it was little things like that. And I'm just like, just leave me alone. Um, and then going back, this was right before I was about to compete. And so I completely disassociated myself. I am proud to say I haven't been on Reddit in over 13 months, not a single thing I've gone on there um, because it was starting to affect me. And I was like, what did I do to these people? Because I know the person that I am and I know that I have good character. What did I do to make like these people hate me so much? 
And I think it was just like, I hate saying like out of jealousy, but I think that it was because I did be start to become so confident in who I was and sure of the person that I wanted to be and where I was headed, that people were kind of mistaking it for arrogance instead of confidence. And someone from my hometown went on Reddit, somehow got a word that people were bashing me on Reddit and started making comments about the person that I was in high school and how like I fucked over all my friends in high school and I've always been a bad person. And like, it just kind of spiraled from there. And I had to just block every single thing out. Every person that would send me something, I would say, hey, please don't send me this. Hey, and if it has to do it with Reddit, please don't send me this. I was getting screenshots, I mean, all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, So it got to a point where I took about 10 days off social media in the middle of my prep. Like, didn't say like, hey guys, I'm gonna take time off social media. I just said, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. And I remember like crying on my floor being like, what the fuck did I do to make these people not like me? And then I realized I didn't give a shit. (laughs) I was like, I don't even know these people. Like, I don't even know your name. I wouldn't be able to recognize you in the grocery store. And you know, every single thing about me, like you have problems, not me. Go get a fucking hobby and do something with your life. Your first thing is what you do when you wake up in the morning is check to see what I'm doing. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm the fucking problem. And that was it it took me a minute to get there because it's easy to be like, oh my God, why don't they like me? And yeah. then I was like, you know what? I fucking like me. <laughs> yeah, I love that. You said that it did affect you for a little bit and it led to emotions, of course. And then so many people sending you like screenshots and making it even more apparent to you, which I think is very <clears throat> difficult to confronting because it's like, okay, I've now had like 30 people And then, you know, there's a lot of people who support you and love you and have your back, but they're also not the people likely going on Reddit to talk shit. So (laughs) they're maybe in your DMs hyping you up, but they're not engaging in that type of content. Now it's been 13 months since you've been on Reddit. Did you stop going because of that? Or was it just like, what was it that led to that? Yeah, I stopped going. I stopped going on there because I it's just such a bad place. It really is. Like no one's going on Reddit being like, this is my favorite person ever. Like they're, they're not going on there hyping people up. I mean, it did get to a point where people were like defending me. And I appreciate that. If you're anyone that did that, like, I really appreciate that. Um, But I just realized it wasn't a good place for my head to be. And the things that people were saying were just outside opinions, because you have to remember, you only know what I allow you to know. If you know something, it's because I told you or I showcased it or I, you know, something. If there's information that you got from somebody, nine times out of 10, it's not true. Um, And me realizing that just rumors and lies, um, I it even stemmed from like people Um, I remember one specifically, I posted that I was so lean, I was 107 pounds, that I couldn't find any shorts that fit me. And it was summer, it was midsummer. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to fit into a pair of shorts. Um, And I had posted that I was at some store. And I was like, lol, found shorts that fit me size 14 and little girls. And I got absolutely murdered from that. People were coming at me like, how dare you post that you're wearing little girl shorts? I have body image issues. I have an eating disorder. How could you post this? That doesn't help me. Like, and I'm like, what the fuck? (laughs) When did I say that I, I'm a bodybuilder, first of all. Like, I didn't say come to this page if you have an eating disorder that I'm going to help you. How am I part of your problem? Like, it was just like things like that that people were just blowing out of proportion because they already knew that I was like a target, if you will, yeah. that it was so easy. It was just easy yeah. at that point. And I, I am so open on social media and I do share so much of my life because I love it that I'm an easy target for you to talk things about my life. There's even people talking about like how creepy my relationship with my brother is and how like it's borderline weird that like I jumped on him after I turned pro and hugged him and like, I wouldn't jump on my brother like that. I'm like, what the fudge, dude? Weird, (laughs) weird shit. Yeah, you know what? I think 
you have a real you've made a really great point about how when people find a target they just keep going for it honestly um it's unfortunate because you could take the same behavior and put it on someone else who is a normal person not with a social media following or any previous history of like a reddit three thread and they're not going to say jack about it and then like because you've already had people talking crap they're like well let's just pick at every little thing like you could do nothing right to these people and i think that's so common with online hate and bullying is like when it's coming to you you have to accept that you're never going to do anything right to them and they're just going to always feel that way about you and like you said you like yourself and that was enough and I want to make a comment really quickly about the ED and the body image because like I exist within the bodybuilding community to serve in food relationships and body image and goals and all this and mental health specifically because I know there's so many people in the mental health world who will shit on bodybuilders for actually loving this sport and changing their body and pursuing it and following a regimented diet for example it is no one's responsibility to protect you from triggers it's even been shown in research that trigger warnings actually don't really reduce the impact of a trigger affecting you so it blows my mind when people say like how could you do this to me I didn't do it to you. I didn't do it to you. Like, first of all, you. you don't even have a profile photo. <laughs> User 10345. Yeah, I'm like, second of all, I'm sorry. Like, you decided to come to my page two weeks out. Like, this is a you problem, fam. Yeah, it's and so also, that's perception. It's not, it's not their reality. So it's like they're looking at what you're doing and they're putting themselves in that position and then assigning it as like a problem for them versus saying she's in a different position than me. She perceives this differently than me. Her intention is different than mine and accepting what's been shared as her own thing. Yep. No, you you nailed that spot on. Yeah, it's all about it's all about perception, but I think in short story, just to, that was a huge, that was online bullying. And I, I remember having a conversation with myself of like, damn, like you're really strong for this because a lot of the things that were being said, I'm like, people legitimately kill themselves over that type of like harassment. Like that was, that was over the top. And the fact that like, I shut it all off and I did what I did and I still, you know, went out and I turned pro that was all I ever needed to say to anybody because there were the comments were, you know, you're not bikini, you're not this, you're not that. And then I went and turned pro and I'm like, okay, now what do you have to say? Oh, right. I'm still not a good person. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Also, I want to acknowledge you for actually owning the fact too, that it did negatively impact you. Cause I think a lot of influencers will be like, I'm not affected by it. It doesn't phase me. I'm like, we're communal beings on some level it's got to affect you right because I think words do matter and Mm -hmm. you know the whole like sticks and stones we break my bones but words but words do matter they hurt because we put weight on words of affirmation we put weight on words of like yay congrats things like that like validating you so of course a negative thing said can have a similar impact like it can still mean something so I also acknowledge you for actually saying out loud like yeah I own that it affected me doesn't yeah. mean the haters are more powerful or they, they they're gratified in that it's, it's just it builds up are, so that's... much over time like it compounded that like I truly felt like, and I'm never going to, I'm not playing woe is me because a lot of this um, were decisions of my own, but it was almost like you're kicking me while I'm down. Like you already know I'm going through this. I have this going on. It's very apparent. This is going on this, 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 and this, like, let's just bully me on top of it. You know, like that's going to do anything. Um, So yeah, it did. It did negatively affect me, but I didn't unpack and stay there. And that's something I, I always like a, a, an analogy I like to say is like, feel it, acknowledge it, but don't unpack and stay there because this is my journey. And I don't have to prove to anybody. I share my journey because it inspire. If it inspires one person, amazing. I did my job. And that's keep at the forefront of, I, of course, everybody still gets, I still get, you know, negative things and negative comments. I remember one comment specifically was so funny. I posted a picture and it was just like, you don't realize that people don't realize you're posing and it's angles. And my, 
my glute looked super or my my delts looked like huge in the angle of the photo because I posed that way yeah. um and someone commented it's not a delt show or a chicken leg show stop fucking bodybuilding already or something like that I can't and I was just like what oh my gosh this is, I like I was gonna read that and be like you know what you're right I'm done <laughs> I know that's oh, like all right. Karen two seven four nine told me I'm not a bodybuilder. Peace out. The sad thing is that these people are nitpicking at you for let's say posting or doing something, maybe calling out whatever your reasons are, while they're waking up to post and get validation and support from other haters saying yeah that is their only high is that they all are bonding off of one thing you guys realize when you really sit with yourself you guys are bonding over the fact that you don't like someone you don't know when you really let that sink in and say like that's pretty fucking weird and I'm sure there's going to be some people you know maybe listening to this that are kind of like yeah I was a part of that I think that's okay if you you were a part of that and you realize like that was fucked up or like that wasn't who I want to be but if you wake up and your number one goal is what is this person doing today to trigger me and you want to bring that to a platform you are what's wrong with the world like there, there's enough and I always say negativity is so loud all you hear is negative 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 and positivity is so quiet that we need to bring positivity up to out, out noise, if you will. I don't know the right word to say. To, to, to bring that up, because it, it is, it's true. When something is negative, everyone hears about it. Did you hear this? Did you hear this? Did you hear this? But when something positive happens, it's so hush-hush. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like, biologically, we're built to protect ourselves from potential for pain or hurt and being outcast in society is one of those things we try to protect ourselves from so when someone's done something that might create that suddenly it's like I am going to make sure everybody knows or we're going to feed this so we can avoid it or prevent it from happening to us but at the same time like I can personally say this is a big reason why I love the bodybuilding community is because there's so much positivity especially when you find your space you find your people like I've never existed in a community with more people who are like this is awesome like this podcast is amazing and and these guests are amazing and these women are awesome and you're doing great at this like it's so it's so wonderful and I've had hate too but like you said sometimes you just that one hate voice just keeps like binging in your head because your brain is literally just trying to be like well they didn't like it and you need community so protect yourself from that but really it's like well let's not forget like you said like raise the volume on all the positives like maybe turn our attention there when we're feeling down and the the crazy thing is to me is the people that are hating aren't even bodybuilders so I'm like you're not a bodybuilder you don't compete like where is your opinion relevant here at all yeah like why don't you go try doing something like this or putting yourself through something that's a little bit more difficult and then you know or be present on a platform because it's not easy to show up and especially in this day you know to show up like like I do on social media I keep it raw and keep it real and show as much of my life as I do I mean I know people who like know my dog's name and like most people that follow me probably know my dog's name and it's like I, I choose to share that stuff and now you're gonna like you're going to daunt me or bring a daunting like aura to the fact that I chose to share this with you. And that goes even like within this podcast, you know, I'm, I'm sharing things that were hard for me. And, and of course I'm healed and I'm happy to share them now and hope that they help somebody. But if you take negative, if you take something negative out of me sharing my journey, um, that that's a really pl sad place to be. And like, I hope that you get help. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. I love how you are being so open and you've shared things you haven't necessarily shared to the depths that you have. And you're leaving such a positive message too, for how people can perceive that. And I think it's unfortunate when people are judged for things that happened eons ago even you know it's like people change right like we evolve just like you can recognize yeah. someone may have participated in that but now recognize it's wrong and you can both move forward that's great there's some people who won't ever let anything go from someone's past they'll do anything they can to dig it up to make them feel ashamed of it or question for it or 
like they can't hold on to that story of who they want you to be because they haven't grown and so even people you know if you're talking about who I was six months ago I'm not that person I'm not even the same person I was a month ago because we're ever evolving humans and I put so much effort and so much work into evolving into the best version of myself possible and I want to be able to affect as many people in a positive way as I can so I'm sorry if during that time you know I negatively affected you and I wasn't who I wanted to be I I didn't love me either and that's okay but now I do so it's unfair of you to correlate me now to who I was then I wouldn't judge you for who you were a year ago that'd be that'd be behoove of me I love that that's such a great point is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish that I would have before I get your best advice? Hmm. Didn't ask me. No, honestly, I think you covered a lot. I think you we had a lot to unpack here. And this has been a really good episode for me to be able to share my story. Like I said, I haven't ever shared some of the things that I that are into the depths that I have. I mean, I know a lot of people have probably been curious about, you know, the outcome Um, so I'm very happy with the way that you asked me these questions and I hope that your listeners can take a lot from this. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for being as open as you have been. Right. When you said that though, a question came to mind that I'm going to ask before I get your advice. Okay. Okay. I notice your ex does still comment on your posts and like, will hype you. Are you guys on good terms? Yeah. On fantastic terms. And that is something that I think is so special to me is because just because the romantic part of the relationship didn't work out, there was still chemistry there and there was still an extreme connection. And Justin is someone who I have a ton of love and gratitude for because I'm not going to say without him, I wouldn't be here, but it would have taken me a lot longer to get here. Um, And I think that it's important to recognize the people that have helped you get to where you are. Um, and, And going back to, you know, not judging the person that you were a year or two years ago. I mean, I think that when, um, to get a little bit more personal, when Justin and I started dating, I think that we were both very broken people and we couldn't, it didn't work because of that. And now we're grown and we have our own things and we have our own perspectives on what happened and why our relationship didn't work out romantically. I don't think that you need to completely get rid of the relationship as a whole, especially he's someone who's very integrated in Brandon's life. Um, and that's not going anywhere. And he is someone who I want a part of my life um, in, in, a, in a best friend manner. So I love the relationship that we've had. And it's taken a lot of work, a lot of hard conversations, a lot of a lot of things to get to this point. But now that we're here, I, I truthfully wouldn't have it any other way because he's still someone that I have in my corner and that I go to, you know, if I need help with anything and vice versa. Um, so we're we're definitely a, we're definitely a good match. I love that. Well, thanks for expanding on that part too. Now, what would be your best advice for someone who has never competed before, but would like to, and then your best advice for someone on their road to pro. If you've never competed before, but you want to compete, I would say, make sure you spend the time falling in love with the, the, the process of building because more times than not, I see first time competitors so excited to compete. And I love that but you compete prematurely and then you may not have an, a good experience. And that puts, that puts a bad rap on bodybuilding for you because you didn't have the experience that you thought you did because you just needed more time. Um, a lot of, a lot of females, I, I even get them that they, they've been only working out maybe like six or seven months and their goal is like, I want to compete. Um, and I say, okay, we need about a year under the bar. And that's daunting to them. Like, well, what do you mean? I can't step on stage. So start to fall in love with the process and, and, the best thing I can say is fall in love with training. If you fall in love with being in the gym and, you know, ripping heavy weights and getting strong, you always have that to fall back on. I mean, even in my darkest days, I knew that I still had the gym and I had training and that was going to be my outlet. And that saved me more times than I can count. So fall in love with the gym. Absolutely. And what about for someone on their road to pro? You only have to beat who shows up. (laughs) (laughs) I love that don't stop showing up get the feedback go into it with an open mind of I am at my best 
I cannot control the rest. If you are at your best, that's all you can do. Go up there, have a good time, walk on stage. And this is something I tell myself, walk on stage like you already are a pro. Tell the judges with your performance, with your eyes, that you're winning this show. And you're not getting off stage till you win this show. And if you don't win this show, what can you do to be better to win the next one? Love that. So what are people going to have to look forward to for you? Like what's in store for your next phase in this journey? Well, as far as competing goes, I'm not stepping on stage. I'm not putting a timeline on anything. I'm going to compete when I know my physique is going to be competitive to be in the mix. I don't want to be backstage pumping up like, what the fuck am I doing here? (laughs) Um, So it's not going to be a day. It's going to be more of a look and a feeling. Um, But you guys can definitely look forward to me expanding my coaching more, expanding the team. We're doing retreats. We're doing meetups. Um, You're going to see my face and a lot of my athletes running the stage in Florida this year. So I'm excited for that. Heck yeah. Yes. You're in Tampa (laughs) now. Welcome. That's so awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So happy. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to be on here and just share my journey and my story. It truly has been very insightful for me to be able to share things and realize how healed I am from some things that have happened. And it's beautiful. It really has been insightful. That's so cool. I love to hear that. And I'd love for everyone to be able to follow you and reach out to you for coaching. So how can they do that? I mean, you can reach out via DM or the link is in my bio. If you guys are interested in becoming a part of the team, please, I welcome you with open arms. It's an awesome community. It's an awesome family. Um, And there's a ton of good information that you're going to gather from this. Awesome. I will put all that in the show notes page. So you guys, that's always on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening first thing on Friday morning, it'll be at the top of the page. If you're listening in the future, scroll down to the category section. It's alphabetized, find Megan's name. And then you're not just going to see all the links, but you'll see a full breakdown of the episode. You'll see a summary of the topics we covered and you'll see episode timestamps. So when you share it with your friends, your teammates, you can say exactly what they have to look forward to and definitely tag us as you guys listen or at the end of it with some of your takeaways. That's always so fun for us or um, if you're excited to hear this and you enjoyed it let us know and leave a rating and a review because that goes a long way for the show and thank you all so much for listening hope you have an amazing rest of your day night or morning wherever you are in the world while you're listening to this episode just make it awesome